Tensions in the south along the border with Gaza continuing to rise as terrorists use incendiary and explosive balloons to spark at least nine fires on Monday afternoon alone. And the IDF, for its part, responding with airstrikes. Israeli Air Force fighters striking several Hamas targets overnight on Tuesday, including a weapons factory, a tunnel entrance, and an underground rocket launcher placed right next to a Palestinian school. This in retaliation against a recent uptick in terror along the Gaza-Israel border, including massive renewed rioting, cross-border shootings, and most recently, the resumption of incendiary balloons. Fire and rescue services responding to at least nine fires across the southern Eshkol region on Monday, and Hamas previously threatening to continue riots into Wednesday. Hamas and other Palestinian terror groups in the Strip reportedly considered their sporadic attacks as pressure on Israel to ease restrictions on the Strip. Hamas allegedly trying to draw a more forceful response from the IDF, which Hamas can then retaliate against and use at the bargaining table during ongoing ceasefire talks with Israel in Egypt, though the violence is seemingly backfiring for now. Egypt has indefinitely closed the Rafah border as punishment for Hamas's recent actions, and only Israel's crossing remains open for aid, humanitarian or otherwise. Israel also okayed the transfer of Qatari funding via the UN and all this in apparent efforts to bolster the ceasefire talks. In fact, the only thing preventing a stronger response from Israel already is reportedly the upcoming meetings between Prime Minister Bennett and Presidents al-Sisi from Egypt and Biden from the U.S. That said, Israel's hesitancy to engage more heavily with Hamas may soon come to an end. Israeli authorities have repeatedly vowed to respond to every aggression from Gaza, and security officials speaking on condition of anonymity, saying that another war between Israel and Gaza terror groups likely inevitable. So are Israel and the Palestinians truly on an inevitable collision course? With me to discuss is Israeli journalist and author of Industry of Lies, attorney Bendol Yamini. Bendol, thanks so much for being back with us. Now, what can Israel really do to quiet the border? Um, I'm not sure that Israel can do something. I mean, uh, we are facing a kind of uh, uh, a real problem, which is uh, which is uh, with us for something like uh, uh, almost 15 years, and we are doing the same again and again. I mean, we uh, have a kind of uh, a new agreement, uh, a new Hudna uh, with the Hamas, uh, and then again uh, they uh, send the rockets and they send the balloons, and 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 I mean, it looks like if if. Every uh, uh, five years, now it might be even much shorter. We have this kind of uh, conflict like uh, protective edge and so on. We have to rethink. That's what we have to do. Uh, uh, because to do the same thing and to, to get the same result, it's not something which is clever. I mean, uh, I think it was uh, Albert Einstein uh, who said it before uh, I did. So, so we have to rethink and, and, and uh, to consider what we are doing. I mean, I think, I think, it's my opinion, we have to offer them, to offer the Hamas everything. When I'm saying everything, I mean uh, a kind of a martial plan, even. I mean, we don't want you to suffer. That's what we have to tell them. But in order to have, uh, uh, to end the siege and in order to, the closure, and in order to, uh, 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 have this kind of uh, rehabilitation, prosperity of uh, the people in Gaza, no more uh, rockets. You have to disarm yourself. If you are ready for that, for this kind of formula, let's go for it. Unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, Israel is not offering. Israel is not initiating anything. I mean, we are doing the same, well, but, but, and we get the same results. And but Ben Dol, realistically... But Bendol, realistically, if Israel were today to go to Egypt where, where they're negotiating with Hamas and say exactly what you just said, to offer the Palestinians everything that they want, economically speaking, uh, open waters, whatever, if they would just disarm, those are old agreements. The Palestinian, the, the Palestinian Authority never, never try, uh, disarmed Hamas. Hamas I mean, is not look, willing to disarm itself. I, 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 I'll tell you something. First, we don't have to say it uh, to uh, Egypt. We have to say it to the whole world. We have to do something very dramatic, a very dramatic uh, 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 step on behalf of Israel. Why I'm saying it? I'm saying it because we know exactly that it will take some hours after the upcoming uh, uh, confrontation will begin, the demonstration will be not against the Hamas, but against Israel. And we will see even Jews 
demonstrating against Israel with the flags of the Hamas against Israel, even if the Hamas is calling to the extermination of Jews. So in order, not, not we, we cannot uh, uh, prevent all this kind of uh, campaign. I mean, there are so many anti-Semites anti out there, nothing that Israel will do uh, will um, uh, uh, come. Them. So the point is that we have to do it for so many other people who do not know that Israel is not asking for any confrontation. Israel wants the people of Gaza to live in prosperity, in welfare. I mean, we want them to live good life. The point is the Hamas, just like in any other place on the planet, wherever you have a global jihad, you have uh, bloodshed and destruction. But people don't know it. That's why we must, we must do something different. We must initiate something. We must initiate a kind of a martial plan in order maybe, just maybe, to change uh, uh, the, the, the whole uh, public opinion about the conflict. Okay, well, so, so now I want to move... I want to change our focus just a little bit. Where does the Palestinian Authority fit into this equation? Because it seems that, for the most part, the PA today is irrelevant, uh, especially amidst the ongoing anti-Palestinian Authority demonstrations in the wake of Nizar Banat's killing, uh, in addition to the rising clashes between Israel and the Palestinians, the West Bank and Gaza, and, and more. Um, it, it, it's part of the tragedy, actually. Uh, I don't know if it was... Uh, a planned policy on behalf of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, but the outcome we know. I mean, uh, the Palestinian Authority is becoming more and more irrelevant, which is not good. Which is not good because what we are going to uh, say one day we will have a kind of agreement with uh, uh, the Palestinian Authority. It will take something like two weeks until the Hamas will take over. I mean, that's what we wanted. I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's good for uh, Israel. And right now, according to the uh, PCR, which is not the PCR of the corona, but the PCR of the uh, Palestinian uh, Center for Research, uh, most Palestinians right now support the Hamas. It's, it's unfortunate, I know, but this is the situation. I mean, if you have more confrontation, uh, the Hamas is gaining more power. And, and, and it's, it is part of the problem. And if there will be uh, uh, one more confrontation, Hamas will be even stronger, even if, even if we know that the result, part of the result will be devastating uh, from the point of view of the Palestinians. But, but this, is, this is the Middle East. This is the Middle East, and we have to face the facts. All right, Ben Dori Yamini, thank you as always. Thank you so much. Moving on, Iran still drifting further and further from compliance with the 2015 JCPOA nuclear deal. And negotiations between Iran and the P5 plus one powers to return to the deal is still at a standoff. Israel then, ever the critic of the deal, still hoping to sway Western policy. Prime Minister Bennett scheduled to meet with United States President Biden on Thursday, where, where he will reportedly present an alternative strategy for confronting both Iran's nuclear program as well as its malign activities in the region and without returning to the arguably defunct JCPOA. Iran is in a very violent and aggressive way in all the areas of the world. I will say to Mr. Biden that this is the time to stop the Iranians, to stop this thing, to not give them a chance to stop the war in the new agreement to the United States government that has already been taken away from him, and it is not relevant to the people who thought of him שהוא רלוונטי. אנחנו נציג תוכנית סדורה שבנינו בחודשיים האחרונים לבלימת האיראנים גם במימד הגרעיני וגם במימד של התוקפנות האזורית. Joining us with more, senior analyst at the Abba Eben Institute of Reichman University and IDF major in the reserves, Danny Citrinowitz. Major, thank you so much for being with us. Now, first off, uh, Bennett will reportedly argue that the 2015 JCPOA is no longer relevant, as we just heard. Given the Ayatollah's rapid nuclear advancements, uranium enrichment, and support for proxy terror. But many still believe that it is the best of all the bad options. What do you think? Well, and the question is, okay, let's assume that Prime Minister Ben is thinking about alternative to JCPOA. What is the alternative? Unfortunately, I can't see any alternative right now. Now, the JCPOA is far from being complete ultimate uh, agreement. I agree on that but it really uh, pushed back the Iranian nuclear program. 
that it would be very hard to find some sort of a silver bullet outside the JCPOA that will push back the Iranian in the nuclear front. Now, I understand the dilemmas, I understand that the fact that returning back to JCPOA, we really strengthen those conservatives within Iran, like President Raisi and, of course, Supreme Leader Khamenei. But I, unfortunately, I cannot see any other option to really roll back the Iranian nuclear agreement other than the JCPOA. So what, so what do you think Bennett's solution will entail? And, you know, what, what could possibly work to address the nuclear issue and the proxy terror issue? I think that Bennett has two options, actually, when coming to the, to the White House. The first option is being uh, some sort of duplicating his predecessor policy, meaning that saying not returning back to JCPOA, adding unrealistic uh, subject to the agreement, like the Iranian missile program or its uh, regional activity. And if he will take or endorse this kind of policy, then nobody will listen to him. His word will be heard, but nobody in the state will listen to him because the United States really want to return back to JCPOA. The other option is being fruitful. Uh, and uh, in, in saying fruitful is that, that I think that what he needs to present to the, the president, the US president, is some sort of a plan how to cooperate together, how to build joint teams that will discuss what will happen if the JCPOA will collapse, how we can rebuild some sort of coalition regime, uh, uh, sanctionism, sorry, that will allow us, together with other uh, members of the international community, to put a lot of pressure on Iran if they'll continue their nuclear program. I think this is kind of, uh, this is some sort of an approach that really will uh, uh, be endorsed by the U.S. president discussing unrealistic uh, actions or presenting uh, intelligence information that the American already has, like uh, a discussion on RIC and uh, what he did 20 or 30 years ago, this is really irrelevant. We need to, to, to think on, on a positive way how to cooperate with the current administration. We have to understand the administration really want to return back to the agreement. We have to understand that the administration have other or bigger fish to fry uh, like the Chinese issue that is uh, much more important to the current administration than Iran. And if we understand that, working with a cooperative way with the current administration, I think that we can really join forces uh, in front of Iran. If we, pay, if we present only unrealistic approach, then nothing will develop and we'll see Iran uh, pushing uh, forward in its nuclear program. So, Major, uh, put, setting aside for just a moment the, the nuclear, the Iran issue, there's also an issue, a breakdown of trust in the wake of the withdrawal from the Afghan, from uh, you know, from Afghanistan. Many, including uh, uh, on interviews here at ILTV, have questioned the Biden administration's trustworthiness, particularly after Biden's 2010 comments on Afghanistan resurfaced, in which the then vice president dismissed humanitarian concerns of a quick exit, saying that we don't have to worry about it uh, because we did it in Vietnam and Nixon and Kissinger got away with it. So how much stock should, should Israel really be putting in what the Biden administration is saying? Uh, can, can they still be trusted in, in, in terms of dealing with Iran and keeping Israel as an ally of the United States, Israel's best interests uh, at heart? I think that the administration has uh, proven in recent years that you really understand the need to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear, nuclear weapons. I think the JCPOA, in, in the mind of the, of, uh, the current administration, is uh, some sort of the, maybe the only option to block Iranian from progressing to nuclear weapons. So in that fact, I think that they already proven that. Regarding the Afghanistan issue, look, I, there, were, there were a lot of analysis on this issue, but I don't think there is a correlation between Iran and Afghanistan. I think the American administration understands the jeopardy in Iran acquiring nuclear weapons. I think they will do the utmost in order to prevent that. And I think that they are obliged to defend Israel. So in that sense, there is no correlation between two subjects. I really think that we can work together with the administration, but only if they will understand the constraint. And again, like I said in the beginning, coming with a positive approach and not unrealistic approach. All right. Major in the Reserves, Danny Citrinowitz, thank you so, so much for joining us again. Thank you very much. Moving on, a state inquiry into the horrific Mount Meron stampede that left 45 people dead is now hearing testimonies. And the police's northern command chief, Shimon Lavi, speaking as the first witness. The 
מן הסתם הוא המשמעותי ביותר גם למחוז הצפוני, ואני בראשו. So far, gross negligence from officials organizing and guarding the event is becoming abundantly clear. Lavi explaining that police were left completely out of the loop regarding regulations at the festival. Additional, Lavi stressing that officials were underprepared to respond to the havoc, adding that he was informed only a day prior to the pilgrimages that no pandemic-related measures would be in place. On the other hand, Rabbi Shmuel Rabinovich, rabbi of the Western Wall and Holy Sites, denying any knowledge of the dangers, telling the commission that organizers, quote, didn't know there was a problem and that nobody told us there was an issue with the Dove Bridge. That said, the Moron tragedy coming after years and years of continued warnings, arguing that the venue was not safe for such an event. In fact, some reports, such as the one issued by the Fire and Rescue Services, was issued just eight days before the Lagba Omer incident, and it came complete with a specific list of necessary repairs and areas of concern, all of which were ignored. In any case, you can decide for yourself whether or not you believe organizers are guilty. The hearings are open to the public and are available for streaming online, with former Supreme Court Chief Miriam Nao heading the panel and reporting any suspicions to the Israeli Attorney General. Now, in other news, COVID may be in the headlines, but it's far from the only disease for which incredible and recent advances have been made. Scientists at Tel Aviv University now publishing amazing progress with brain cancer. Khan Rifkin with the report. An historic moment in the fight against cancer. Israeli researchers have now found a way to use patients' own cells in a form of 3D printing material. And they use this biomaterial to make a model of the patient's tumors in which doctors can test the efficacy of potential treatments before trying them out for real in the body. And to complicate things further, the scientists from Tel Aviv University focusing on glioblastoma, or the most common form of brain cancer in adults, a cancer which is also among the most aggressive, carrying with it a very poor prognosis. The authors of the study, published in the Journal of Science Advances, explain that current tumor and cancer models just didn't do the job. One thing that we identified was that the models are incorrect. The models we are using for decades are of only cancer cells on a petri dish that is made of rigid plastic that doesn't have any resemblance to the brain of the patient or of, the, of people in general. And what we wanted to create is a 3D as opposed to two-dimensional plate where we grow the cells in a gel that mimics the tissue of the brain much more accurately, and hence this translates to the behavior of the cancer cells. Meanwhile, contributing to the model's realism, we added other cell types that are the environment of the brain, those resident cells in the brain, like immune cells and other cells that usually sit on the, in the brain, and blood vessels, functional blood vessels that we can flow through them, drugs and immune cells, red and white blood cells of the same patient. Finally, once printed, the researchers pump the imitation tumor with the patient's blood, followed by the potential treatment. And a treatment is deemed promising if either the printed tumor shrinks or if metabolic activity is lowered against control groups. Ofra Benny, who leads similar research at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, calling the study a potential game changer in the field of personalized medicine. All right, for our final story today, Israel now welcoming its first ever private university, the Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya. And this has the IDC finally receiving official university status by Israel's Council for Higher Education 27 years after its founding. But ILTV's Asaf Nisan has the details. The Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya, or IDC in short, has been known as one of the most prestigious private colleges in the state of Israel. Established in 1994, with high-end facilities, top-of-the-line teachers, and an academic level that is equal to that of the Ivy League schools in the U.S. But now, the school is about to go to the next level. Israel's Council for Higher Education, headed by Education Minister Yifat Shashabiton, has officially approved its status as a university. It feels like uh, modern-day Zionism is being created here at IDC Herzliya by our being declared Israel's first private and non-profit university. The university, which will be called Reichman University, will be, will be the first private university in the state of Israel and will be named after the founder and the president of the IDC, 
Professor Uriel Reichmann. This has been the vision and dream of Professor Reichmann for the last uh, 27 years, fighting bureaucracy. Um, and basically, it's a dream come true. Uh, this university was founded uh, with a mission statement of Zionism. The university was actually created in order to create new leadership for the state of Israel, for the Jewish world and the world at large. From day one, he saw it as a university. That was the goal that he said to himself. And according to former education minister Amnon Rubinstein, Israel will join the countries that have excellent private elite institutions. <laughs> אנחנו מדברים על מוסד אקדמי שבסוף כשמקלפים את הכל מגיע לו לקבל את ההכרה כאוניברסיטה. But not everyone is happy about this change, as some voices have called out against this decision, since a private university might create new classes in society, where only the rich and, and well-connected may be able to afford learning there. So when you walk in the campus of IDC, you see a very good mixture of uh, Israelis and uh, international students. And the common denominator is the passion. It's the passion to learn, it's the passion to innovate, it's the passion to be actually a, a leading uh, uh, star uh, for the Israeli academia. There has been so many efforts by the uh, public universities to prevent us becoming a university. And I think we have shown them that uh, just it has been done today. But despite it all, IDC has finally reached their goal and became a university, thus finally competing with the other universities in Israel, saving one difference. IDC will still continue to be a private school without any need for government funding. We never asked for a penny from the Israeli government. And everything you see here in front of you is something which we created ourselves without taking any tax dollars uh, from the state of Israel, tax shekels from the state of Israel. Okay, and it's uh, very, very fulfilling. We have the largest international school in the country. I'm privileged to be the head of it. It's tremendously satisfying that all of these students who came to study here in a college can now put on their CV that, they're graduate, that they graduated a university and not a college. And it's uh, been a long time coming. Just like in the 1980s, we privatized the Israeli telephone company, and instead of taking eight years to get a telephone, it took eight minutes. Asaf Nisan. ILTV News. Now let's take a look at the weather forecast with Hannah Rifkin. So in the next 24 hours, we're expecting to see clear sunny skies and meteorologists calling for more typical August lows, getting down to between 19 to 28 degrees Celsius tonight. Then daytime tomorrow, temperatures rising to between 29 to 37 degrees Celsius and 41 in a lot. Now back to the studio with Aaron. And now before we go, let's take a look at what's going viral in Israel. If I'm reading this video right, I think this soldier just birthed another one. Oh gosh. Welcome to the IDF, I guess. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.22 shekels to the American dollar and 2.55 shekels to the Canadian dollar. Finally, for the latest updates and news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel as well as to our newsletter at ILTV.tv. I'm Aaron Porras. Be well. Thank you very much for watching. <laughs>